we dropped my son off at Virginia Tech. We lived in, in Fairfax. It was about a four-hour drive. And I held it together for all two days until the final goodbye. Held it together through the final goodbye. We got to about two blocks away, and I came apart. You came apart, too? <laughs> I did. I did. I did. And then two weeks later, you realize the house is still neat. <laughs> and then it's okay. You All don't right. need to clean that other bathroom either yeah. as much. Uh, Damon Wright joins us from the Board of Education. Damon, do you have any similar stories to tell? Oh, gosh. Well, let's see. There was a time my daughter went off to basic training, and I almost broke down, seeing mm-hmm. her get on the plane for the first time by herself. And then we just took her back Tuesday to finish up grad school, which that was fine. No, no, no tears, no issues. It's that first separation. Plus, it's a little bit more stressful when your kid's going into the service because there's always the possibility that the ultimate price could be paid. So that's, you know, my, my nephew went off to the Marine Corps, and that's one of those things you think about, mm-hmm. right? So, but I'm, uh, we're glad it all worked out for you. Was she in the Army? Uh, she's in the Air Force. Air, Air Force. Force National Guard, so. Very good. Uh, hey, I'm sure you've been keeping up with the most recent conversations in this last hour. Damon, as I saw some of your comments on our Facebook page, first and foremost, let me express my disappointment uh, that you're on the phone because I understood there was a possibility if you came in person, there would be food involved. <laughs> yeah, I planned on making some um, miniature pineapple upside down cakes, but I had an emergency. I had to drive to Virginia last night, and I'm like, I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I do not have time to, to bake tonight, so I just relaxed. We're sorry you had your emergency. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the discipline committee, if we could, for a second, Damon. I saw that you and Jackie both pointed out there actually is an attorney that's on that discipline committee. Uh, yes, there is one. We just want, I, I actually appointed them because I wanted um, someone just, just from a different point of view. I didn't think of things from a legal perspective um, and just not that they were an educational law expert, but just mm-hmm. somebody with just that different mindset. Um, that may not be considered. Just having a diversity of opinions and ideas and uh, ways of thinking. Matt pointed out the complexity of education law and how when you consider that there are so few education law experts available, it's no wonder that the admin in schools feels like their hands are tied on some of these issues. Do you think that's part of the equation? Uh, It could be. I know we have, um, the school system has a council, um, who are very, they're excellent um, at the education law. And then, of course, every year we go for training, but it's just so much and it's it's very detailed. And so we a lot of times go through them to make, to make sure, are we going too far with the law or are we not going far enough? Are we, are we in compliance, basically, so that we can keep um, basically fiscally responsive and not get sued and or, or get somebody harmed? by not following what we're supposed to follow. So we, we take a lot of things through them just to make sure uh, we don't make any huge mistakes. A text to me from a longtime Berkeley County School employee who asked to remain anonymous mentioned being the victim of an assault in the school by a student, special education student, I believe was specifically in this, in this case. And effectively, once they filed their paperwork, uh, it was their own job security that they were threatened with, with wanting to pursue it any further. Hmm. And obviously nothing ever came of it. Uh, so I want, if you could, uh, you don't know the specifics of that case, and I can't tell you the name, so I'm just kind of throwing that out there. But maybe you could talk to me about the general approach to handling the paperwork in these particular situations, how the school addresses it, and if there's such a thing as too many disciplines, we can't go over a certain number because... Uh, it will affect the, how the state is funded, or how the sta- how the uh, I'm sorry how the how the school is funded, or or how the reviews go uh, ultimately. Um, I actually encourage all teachers, all staff to complete all discipline paperwork to be as accurate as possible. Um, I know for years that has not been uh, something a lot of people want to do, especially when it's found, say, for instance, Muslim. Uh, has a whole lot of discipline reports, but North, for instance, has a low low amount. Well, it could be because North isn't reporting everything, and so then Muslim finds out what they're not reporting is so we look like the worst school in the county. Mm-hmm. So then they start. So it's, it's sort of, like, sort of like that that effect that it has. If everyone's not being accurate, we can't really tell where there's a really real problem and what changes may need to happen. 
And then, of course, like was pointed out earlier, those reports go up to the state, and then the state sees, wow, they have such terrible issues. It may not be that we're having terrible issues. It could just be we are trying to hold students accountable for their actions, and this is these are the steps that we're taking. And right now, I, I try to warn people, if we are going to be accurate, we're going to see a huge spike in discipline reports and in our numbers. But to me, that's okay because it shows we're, we're at a starting point. We're going to start here. And we're going to try to bring those numbers down just because when students see that there are consequences for their actions, when parents see that they can't just come into the office and yell and scream and little Johnny now is no longer in trouble, um, that eventually things will change. But it's going to take us having the courage to and, and to be able to explain to the state this is why this is happening. So please don't come here and try to take over our school system thinking we're not doing our jobs. We're actually doing what we're required to do. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that last part up because there would be one thing if this was in a bubble and you were just comparing Berkeley County schools, but if all the schools start faithfully filing these reports, yet in the other 54 counties, it's still kind of like, hey, we aren't going to file this one so we don't look so bad. Then you do run the risk of Berkeley County looking like it's the Wild West and the rest of the schools are going, well, you don't have a problem. Exactly. Yeah. When they actually do, but but they They don't want anybody to to know that, especially at the state level, because, like I said, then you have potential for takeovers or or even just in those – when you go online and look at those, oh, how great are these schools, you know, the different grades that they give. Well, discipline ties in there too. So you you may have a great great teachers, great staff, everybody, if their hands are sort of tied or they feel the perception, they don't want that bad perception. All those things tie in. It shouldn't, but everybody's human and it does. John. Are we creating incentives for administrators to shield their numbers? For example, if in fact, I'll pick Berkeley County just as a hypothetical, um, but Berkeley County reports all of their numbers and and all of the high schools report all of their numbers 100% accurately, and they're the only one in the state that does that. We we have real data and, and we can create real solutions or at least start real solutions, and that's kind of the goal. But is there a consequence, a negative consequence to in this case, hypothetically, Berkeley County, having the bad number, the worst numbers in the state, does somebody get fired as a result of that? Are we trying to actually get data? Or are we trying to punish administrators? Well, that, that, and I would say that would come from, from the state level. And even, I'm sure, many of our legislatures would, would then say, well, look how bad Berkeley County is, and they would try to fix a problem that's not, but there isn't a need to fix because we're actually, the actual issue with the other 55 counties that aren't being accurate. Um, so it, it, it does create a problem when Berkeley County looks like the outlier and looks like the worst school system because then the state's going to be like, hey, we need to go in there and see what's going on and take this up, maybe even take over the school system, which they have done in other counties for, for various reasons. And so then, of course, like you said, people don't it, – it's, it's hard for the administration to want to do that, to be that outlier and – like I said, I, I don't agree with it. I think we should be the outlier, and if the state wants to come and question that, we say this is what we're doing. You know, this is why we're doing it. We want to be as accurate as possible because this is what you want, and we're these are our steps we want to to take. And we we're going to see these numbers come down once people realize that Berkeley County doesn't play. We're not playing around with discipline. We want our students to be educated. We want those that are disruptive to stop being disruptive, and they will do that once they see that there's going to be consequences. We can't change what happens in the homes. If they're not being held accountable there, there's nothing we can do about that. But when they come to school, they're going to know here there's going to be consequences. Once you leave here, if you want to act crazy and wild, that's between you and your parents. Well, it seems to me you've painted a picture here where we need to change strategy because there's no good reason then for administrators to accurately report these numbers. There's no upside to reporting the numbers accurately, and there's a lot of downside. So maybe, maybe we need to stop looking at the at the numbers and start looking at something else. Well, I think we, I think it's, I think it's a combination. I think we do need to look at the numbers because we can know what types of problems are occurring, and come up with strategies to, to tackle those. Or we can see, okay, the numbers have gone up, but this one particular school, they are way above or way under. Because those that are way under, okay, why is that? What is going on in that school setting that is making it a, a, a better place, a better learning environment? 
and we can use that those, those administrators those tactics to maybe take it to other schools or, or and vice versa things the school that's having very bad issues the administration can maybe send some more supports and more more help and figure out how can we turn this around so that's where the the data can be useful but i do see like you said you're, you're correct there is there is a lot of downside to it um if um outside groups don't understand and even the community we it takes um communication with the community to let them understand this is why and this is going on our, our schools are not the wild wild west but we are just being more accurate with what we're reporting and we want you to be a part of the solution be like the um um, parent that was kind of, uh, Miss Compton that made a comment earlier, be a part of the school system, help the volunteer, help to you know find ways to support our our staff because we are struggling with staffing. This analogy is not going to be one hundred percent correct, but it, it's close. I spent thirty five years of my life managing safety programs, and one of the things that we learned about or it became very clear is that punishing bad behavior does not improve workplace safety programs. What, Im what improves workplace safety programs is rewarding the proper behavior. And I just throw this out for consideration. If, if we were to start some kind of, lack of a better term, kindness programs in the school and re rewarding students and rewarding schools for doing good things in good ways, I think maybe that will, um, that will produce better numbers. Oh, we actually do do that. Um, I've actually seen some of the um shout out that to do for students that are just doing hey this student uh did was kind to to uh show the kindness and they they put their picture up and they do things like that and i totally agree even those students that are misbehaving find the areas that they are behaving in and compliment them on the things you know say hey i really appreciate you doing this or that whatever it is that they're doing and they'll and that as mr haddix said that's sort of discipline in a way you're you're, you're providing some positive reinforcement behind what they're doing. So I, I don't want to seem like I'm the just come down and, and just slam everybody and be just straight suspensions and out of school and you're going to do all these terrible things. No, there's positive things that we can find, areas that they're doing well in, that they're being positive in, keep pushing those things to encourage the student to keep doing those things. It's, it's almost like being a parent. You encourage the things you want to see. And, and Matt Harvey, by the way, if you wanted to ask anything about the school system besides discipline, that's okay too. I don't want, I don't want anybody to think we're just doing this on discipline. Though. No, no. I, yeah, John has I think wants to suggest a kindness committee, and he'd like to be the chair of it. You don't want me to be the chair. No, of anything. no. <laughs> that's, that's, no uh, Damon, I was going to ask you actually, um, how your expectations of being on the school board have they come true? What's been the most surprising since you've been on the school board that you've learned about the, the process? Uh, probably the most surprising is the number of hours uh, that people don't see that we're behind the scenes that we're working. Um, the hours that we're you know, in the schools, trying to talk to teachers and staff, the meetings um, that get extended. Um, that looks none of us, you know, we're, none of us in it for the money, but like we'll have two or three meetings that we we'll just extend so that it all counts as one paid meeting. And there's a lot of work sessions, and there's just a lot of information um, behind the scenes that I, I wasn't aware of. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm now I'm a part of that to see what what goes on from the outside. You think, oh, they just go come here, um, they just rubber stamp everything. Well, um, <laughs> anybody that watched our meetings the last year uh, and some of the positions that we even held up for months on end so, shows that that's not really the case. But it's it, it's been um, a good experience. I've enjoyed doing it, um, but it's, it's, it's a lot more work than, than what I originally anticipated. Do you think the Berkeley County schools are on the right trajectory and that everything's being done as best as possible? I think everything's being done as best as possible, but no, I do not think it's going in the right trajectory in terms of staffing, um, in terms of, um, and in some ways, even community support. Just because we need, and this is a nationwide thing, we just need more certified, trained teachers, teachers that understand classroom management, subject matter experts, um, and less of the, uh, the the language and things that are said that will discourage many of our youth from going into education. Uh, the numbers are, are down across the nation in terms of education degrees, and it's, it's just very disheartening. Um, and, that's, and that, of course, then goes down to the burnout from our current teachers because 
they can't take a break because there's no one there to give them a break. 30 years ago, hey, you have people that can cover for you, you have adequate staffing, but now it's just everybody's getting stretched so thin, and it's without more more bodies and more people to help, it, it's, it's very difficult to prevent that burnout. Damon, one of the frequent um, criticisms that I hear about the schools in general, or more specifically towards the school board, is that there is uh, too many administrators and not enough teachers, and that the board office keeps growing and growing with administrators, and that that somehow that number is out of whack. Uh, do you have any perspective on that? Um, actually, um, Mr. Murphy brought that to our attention at the last board meeting. He provided some numbers showing that uh, the number of administrators we had, even when Mr. Arbonne was in, was a superintendent. And just looking at the total number of administrators, um, it's close to the same. It's now, in some departments, in some areas, it has increased, um, and we're looking into that. But overall, the total number of people in the board office <clears throat> hasn't increased substantially. Um, and even looking at, like was pointed out, other area counties, we're, we're not um, – as overstaffed as I, as I thought when I first started, when I first came to the office, I thought, oh man, there's too many, there's too many people in here, there's too many administrators, we're way out of whack on the numbers, but we had an outside group come in and audit our, our uh, county versus others, and we were under many of those. Now, some would say they're bloated, and just us being under them, is we can still be bloated too, which I get, but um, when you see the size of our county and it's constantly growing, um, you need people in administrative levels that can um, manage that that large group of, of people and large group of tasks. It's just people services alone. It's just it's a, a lot of people that are needed to handle all of the calls, all of the requests, all of the different problems that go on um, that parents need help with. Damon Wright is our guest, member of the Berkeley County Board of Education. Damon, I want to ask about the uh, aides in the classrooms and how Berkeley County came about deciding first grade was the place to start these aides. Uh, you obviously, you had the choice up to third grade. And if you have actually filled all the positions, too. Um, in terms of, I think it was mainly start, decided on first grade just because that's, it's just the beginning. Let's start there in the beginning to... Um, get the students, get that extra help early. Um, because the earlier you get get uh, things started, um, the better it will be. You don't want to wait. Well, at least personally, I wouldn't want to wait till third grade to find out a student has an issue. I'd rather get that help early in first grade. Um, that is going to be an issue because a lot of, what was said, a lot of people that are in other um, career paths will then now, oh, I want to, they'll switch to be an aide. So then, we have to backfill those positions. So it's people that are already in positions then going to be aides. Well, that's going to create a shortage somewhere else. So that's um, a problem that the legislator create, legislature created for us because of that. I mean, we're I'm appreciative that we're getting the help, but um, just getting the staffing and the funding and everything is just that's that's a, a problem. Um, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. If you've been able to fill all the positions, uh, most of them were. Um, we're down. Uh, just looking at the numbers. Give me one second. We're oh, we're just about where we need to be on hiring. Um, we still have a few positions we need to fill, but for the most part, um, we're we're much further along than I thought we would be. We should be in the single digits. I'm sorry, the, uh, instead of the triple digits in terms of uh, vacancies, we should be very low here. Uh, I'm sorry. I, tried, I thought I had it pulled up, and I just lost my That's fine. information. Does that apply to bus drivers and service workers as well? Uh, yeah, it applies to, to all those positions. Uh, um, let's see. So, oh, so service, we had uh, 299 posts. We uh, filled 235. There's still 64 open, and 20, 29 of those are aides. So um, HR is still actively trying to fill all those vacancies. Um we should be in the uh, for classroom teachers. We should be in a single day just by Monday, at our next board meeting. Plus, we fill in a few more positions. So, classroom teachers were almost where we need to be in terms of uh, staffing. Uh, we still need a lot more of a service. Very good. All right. Uh, any final thoughts from you as we get ready to begin a school year on Monday, Damon? No, I just wanted um, 
you know, we're going to go pray for a safe year for all of our students and staff and that they will be a part of trying to, to help Berkeley County Schools, um, you know, be a part of the PTA, be a part of the LSIC groups. Any way you can feel that you can help our students and staff, we would appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Damon Wright from the Board of Education at 931.